our scripture reading today is Matthew 6, 25 through 34. It says, do not worry, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See, the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you little of faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough, enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. The alarm on her phone did not go off when it was supposed to. Apparently, she had forgotten when she opened the alarm app on the phone. Um, she set the time, but she didn't slide the little, you know, the little button that you slide into the on position so the alarm works? She didn't do that. And it was the sound, the rumble of the school bus going by that woke her up. She leapt out of bed and immediately woke the kids. Apparently, she had slept through the sounds of her husband getting up earlier than usual and leaving for work because he had a big project to get on to. But it was the first day of school. They had gone to the beach the evening before for one last summer hurrah. It had been kind of a spontaneous thing, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. And it had turned out to be a great family time, actually a parenting success. There were no jellyfish stings, no sunburns, no significant kid quarrels, no flip-flops had dragged tar balls into the minivan. Real fun. And there were pictures, pictures to prove it. Yes. And now this. Monday morning had come. And since they had gone to church on Sunday morning and then spontaneously gone to the beach on Sunday evening, there had been no time to pack the lunch boxes. but she was going to get up early to do that. The new school supplies had all been purchased. They were still in the grocery sacks in the back of the minivan underneath the beach toys and the sand. She had envisioned making a good breakfast to get them off to a good start. Everything was in the fridge, and there was no chance that was happening today. Kids, get moving. We've got to be out the door in 30 minutes. Move it. You've got a half hour. She shouts from the bathroom as she skips a shower, throws on her favorite work clothes, because that's an easy answer, which she discovers are feeling a bit snug. And as she looks down, sees also that there's a lovely stain that came from somewhere. No time to deal with that. On she goes, commanding the situation. She directs the children to put food in the lunch boxes, and she doesn't care what. <laughs> Dig out the school supplies, she tells them. Dust the sand off of them and throw them in your backpacks. Brush your teeth, tuck in your shirts, feed the pets, and get in the van. As she tosses each kid a granola bar, she's feeling pretty successful. She thinks they're going to make it on time. And then it hits her. The picture! The first day of school picture! And quickly decides that's more important. Unloads everybody, takes the back to school picture, and makes them smile. But they can't completely conceal it. It. Behind the forced smiles, 
they can't really hide it, and neither can mom as she looks past the iPhone camera at the kids, her babies. She knows they're all stressed. They're all worried. What a way to start the day. What a way to start the school year. And mom vows she won't let this happen again. She's not going to let her kids or herself start another day stressed and anxious and hurried and worried. So that brings us to the first practical tip of our Back to School Survival Guide series that we're starting today and for the next four weeks. Number one is establish helpful routines to manage stress. Whether you are a parent with a child starting a new school year or whether you are a single person, happily or unhappily, of any age, with or without dependents, I assure you that the practical tips for back to school that we're going to cover during this series are for you too. Okay, so don't check out for the next few weeks thinking I'm only talking to folks with school-age kids. This is practical stuff and biblical principles that are good for all of us. So we can all benefit, as you well know, from developing routines to manage stress in our lives. The family in our story can prepare breakfast and lunch boxes with healthy foods each evening while they're cleaning up from dinner, unless they have a spontaneous trip to the beach. As soon as the day's homework is done, they can reload their backpacks and get them ready for the next day and place them by the door. Everyone can lay out their clothes the night before, including mom, and make sure they fit and don't have any stains on them. The day can be closed all together, reading. Parents, if there's more than one, can divide duties taking turns, tucking in, and praying with their children, and getting a better start even the night before. A new school day will create less worry for everyone when parents rise before the children and spend time in prayer, maybe some exercise, get themselves dressed and ready before waking the children and avoid the mad rush. Scripture or devotional might be read over breakfast, even if it's just standing at the kitchen counter. Or maybe a child could read from a devotional while they're en route to school. And mom drives. No matter what your life stage, this takes planning and discipline to carry out. But having a routine actually helps everybody worry less. Keeping a routine can make the load feel lighter, even if it's really the same load. It can make it more manageable. It can help you to take it easy or at least easier. I've been singing that song all week long, by the way, but the words really don't apply to church. <laughs> but no matter your life situation, even with the best of routines, there are going to be times where it feels like all the plates are spinning at once and you can't reach any of them. Things can seem to spin out of control and worry comes. And that brings us to our biblical principle. For this installation of our Back to School Survival Guide, God watches over you and God knows what you need. So trust in God. Trust in God. Jesus understands that we human beings are prone to worry about all the little things in life, what we will eat and what we will drink and what we will wear and about our bodies, as just the few examples that he gives here in Matthew 6 tell us. These are things we worry about. It is human nature. We want to believe that we are in control of our lives. And when things get out of control like they did for the family in our story, we feel overwhelmed and frustrated. And these feelings, if they become kind of our modus operandi, our status quo, can lead to bad behavior. In the moment, they can lead to bad behavior like yelling at the kids. But over time, those feelings can contribute to unhealthy and even destructive actions, self-medication, greed, chronic anxiety, real depression. 
And so, Jesus offers an alternative. It's the same thing that I preached about last week. It's faith. This passage really is about faith. Last Sunday, I defined faith as trust in God, leaning on God, not just believing that there is a God, that God exists, but believing that God is present with you, that God knows you and cares about you, about us, and about all of the creation that God made. That God is a caring parent. Even if you never had a caring parent in your life, that you can believe, trust, embrace that the God who made you is a caring parent whom you can trust to help you. In today's reading, Jesus clarifies what faith is by clarifying what faith is not. Faith is not worrying about your life. That's not faith. Now, the goal of faith is not to get rid of worry, but it is a side effect of having rightly placed faith that we will worry less and take it easy more. In this portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that we are reading from, remember the Sermon on the Mount in these early chapters of the, Ma- of the Gospel of Matthew, and this portion of the Sermon on the Mount starts with this warning in verse 24, not to divide our loyalties, not to try to split our faith between God and money or material things. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You can't have it both ways. You'll end up hating one and loving the other, devoted to one and despising the other. He is clear that you cannot serve or be attached to material matters and also truly, completely put your faith in God too. Being all mentally wrapped up in material things causes worry. And Jesus invites us into God's realm, into God's way. Instead of being overly concerned about the things of the world, and what a beautiful illustration, simple uh, illustration Nakia shared with the children earlier, that, that classic oil and water, these two things don't mix. They don't go together. Whether we are rich or poor by the world's standards, at times we all have reasons, naturally, that we worry and we fret. But deep down we know that none of the fretting and worrying does a single thing to change things for the better for us or for anybody else. It's tempting for us to look at this kind of backward. To think that if we just have enough faith, then we won't have any worries. To try to use faith as a sort of means to psychological improvement. But the aim of faith is not to lessen anxiety. Rather, the aim of faith is to recognize and relate to and rely on the one who created and governs the cosmos. Now, when we do that, worry can decrease. The faithful one, who is waxing eloquent here in Matthew chapter 6 about the lilies and the birds and the grass, is actually the one who created all of that beauty with his own hands. Hands that would one day be pierced in order to renew the lilies and the birds and the grass and you. If God is faithful to care about the lowly birds and the mindless flowers and grass, plenty of which are never even going to be seen by another creature, then how much more is God faithful to care for us? the ones who were created in God's own image. We can take it easy and worry less and not live in fear when we have faith in the maker of all things, the one who lived and died and rose to take away all of our reasons for worry and for fear in the end. 
So Jesus begins bringing this section of the Sermon on the Mount, um, this teaching, to a conclusion at verse 32 and makes three final points in the last three consecutive verses. First, in verse 32, he says that his followers should not conform to the ways of their neighbors who worry over material things. Isn't that always a temptation for us? To forget that our aim as disciples is not to keep up with the Joneses. Our aim as disciples is not to follow after and be like our neighbors, but rather to seek to be like Jesus. And it's hard when we've got people all around us in our daily lives who are living by different values and standards who are living as though the one with the most toys or money in the end wins. But that's a lie. The second point in Jesus' wrap-up here in verse 33 is to remind his disciples that God already knows what you need. He says to them, if they will put God and God's kingdom first, then God will look out for their daily needs and for ours. And the third and final point in Jesus' wrap-up in verse 34 is a reminder of the same key message that he also stated in verse 25, don't worry, don't worry. But this time he specifies not to worry about tomorrow, to stay focused on today. Disciples, just like anybody else, can't control their future. We can't control our future. Each day has its own problems, regardless of how we human beings may anxiously try to plan and control. Even the best routine, for back to school or otherwise, can't ensure that everything is going to go perfectly. Even Jesus' people sometimes lack for the things we need. Some people who follow Jesus are faithful and love him lack even for basic necessities sometimes. So back to the tip that we started out with. Establish helpful routines to manage stress. Routines help us to prioritize and make room for what matters in our lives, for what really matters to us. So as you think about your routines or lack of routines in your life, What do your routines say about what really matters to you, what your priorities are? Parents, grandparents, guardians, caregivers, neighbors, friends in Christ, all of us. Children are learning from us. Children are learning from us. For good or for bad, they are watching us listening to us even when we think we aren't really addressing them. We're talking to another grown-up or something. They overhear, they absorb, they copy our attitudes and our actions. Do the children in your life seem stressed? If you've got kids in your life, do they seem stressed? Are you showing that way of life to them? Are you showing them helpful patterns and routines for living? Moreover, are you showing them faith in the living God? If we've got our priorities out of line, then we should not be at all surprised when we raise a generation that has its priorities out of line. Where'd they get that? This do not worry business, this faith business, is about priorities. There's less to worry about when you've got your priorities straight. Now, all of that said, words alone won't do it. It takes action, example. What leads to worry more than telling somebody not to worry? (laughs) To tell a child or an adult not to worry is like telling them not to think of an elephant. Now, y'all don't think of an elephant. Maybe elephants haven't crossed their minds or your minds in weeks, but the suggestion itself provokes elephant on the brain. (laughs) So it is with the command not to worry. So don't just say it. Model it. 
Be it. Live it. Have faith. Trust God. Remember and demonstrate that God watches over you and knows what you need. Pastor Matthew Bolton puts it beautifully, and I close with this quote from a commentary on this passage. The whole of creation, from wing to petal, is continually under God's delicate, loving care. You are constantly in God's delicate, loving care. Thanks be to God. Amen.